There was a conference last week in Exeter, it was the Global Tipping Points Conference, and there was a study at the meeting there that suggested that if we want to avoid irreversible world-changing tipping points... Yes, please. Which, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if we don't stop putting CO2 into the atmosphere, then we should start altering the atmosphere to slow down heating. In other words, we should do geoengineering. Right. So this is a model that looks specifically at this crucial ocean current we've discussed on the podcast before, the AMOC or the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. It carries heat from the tropics to Europe. And if the AMOC collapses, and and we're probably talking next century here, maybe, maybe a bit earlier, if the AMOC collapses, there could be rapid sea level rise in North America, severe drops in temperatures in Northern Europe, and serious disruption to monsoons across Asia. Big, big effects. And uh, the small matter of a total collapse in agriculture in you know, northern Europe, much of Europe. Bad so things. A total disaster. Mm, yeah. Can't be allowed to happen. Um, if the AMOC does turn off, there's no turning it back on again. Um, even if we did somehow suddenly get to, you know, back down to under 1.5 degrees of warming. So that's why it's a tipping point. Mm. That's why people say we should do everything we can to avoid it. It is... Geoengineering is hugely controversial. There's lots of reasons why uh, we're going to get into that. Mm. Uh, and not least that it could be used as a weapon in war. So that's what we're getting into today. Mm. But at this Exeter meeting, there were you know, about 200 delegates. They put out a statement calling for action from policymakers and especially uh, global leaders attending uh, COP30 in Brazil, the climate summit later. And the statement said these world leaders must take immediate action to prevent devastating tipping points like AMOC. Um, And here's part of the statement. I just want to read it out. The window for preventing these cascading climate dynamics is rapidly closing, demanding immediate, unprecedented action from policymakers worldwide and especially from leaders at COP30. This is a human rights and planetary health imperative and ultimately a matter of survival. So strong words, but of course there have been many strong statements from scientists before and we're yet to see that sort of unprecedented political action that's needed. So what else can we do? There is, of course, geoengineering. Uh, These are ideas along the lines of uh, adding particles to the atmosphere, for instance, um, these kind of big projects that could limit warming. And as you said, it's hugely controversial. Uh, Michael LePage was at the Tipping Points meeting in Exeter. Michael, I gather geoengineering was one of the ideas they were discussing there. It was, and as you're saying, very, very controversial. So because of the risk, there are some climate scientists who don't even want to research this. Uh, And in fact, at one of the sessions that was focused on geoengineering, there was one attendee who refused to even go to it at all. So that's uh, out of principle, out of principle, not going. Yeah, yeah. interesting. And and we're going to come on to those dangers shortly. Um, But shall we start with what are the potential benefits? Can geoengineering really help us prevent these scary tipping points? So yes. Geoengineering potentially can prevent these tipping points, but there is a big catch. Now, one of the talks at the meeting was about what would happen if we injected uh, sort of aerosols into the stratosphere to reflect sunlight, uh, in, specifically to prevent the risk of the collapse of the AMOC current. Uh, so in practical terms, it would mean having planes flying around in the stratosphere and releasing these particles, and then they reflect the sunlight and they cool, them, cool things down. It's the same as what happens if a volcano erupts. Uh, anyway, so according to a model by Claudia Viennes at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, that would, if we didn't do this and we carried on pumping CO2 into the atmosphere, the strength of the AMOC would decline by more than half. But if we do this geoengineering, we could um, largely maintain AMOC at the current strength, even if we're still emitting CO2. This is doing enough geoengineering to keep the temperature around 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, and in fact, she said that in her scenarios, geoengineering worked better at preserving AMOC than simply reducing emissions fast. So it actually, geoengineering was more effective uh, at preserving AMOC than, than sort of reducing climate emissions in this particular model. So obviously, there's a strong case. That sounds like a strong case to do it. Yeah. Um, but I don't think I've heard a case made before saying that we've got to the point where geoengineering is, is more effective than emissions reduction. Yeah, it's this one model, and uh, obviously um, it's for this one purpose of maintaining the AMOC. We don't know what the other consequences would be necessarily. So, of course, there are also huge uncertainties about how AMOC is going to behave, and we don't know that one model is necessarily going to tell us right. to sort of represent that very well. So there are huge uncertainties. We can't take this as 
it's definitely going to work. Mm. And you did say that there's a big catch to this as well. Yes. Yeah, so the catch is uh, we need to do it soon. So Vienna has also looked at what would happen if we did geoengineering, but we didn't start until 2080. So you'd wait until 2080 and then you'd start pumping out the sulfate aerosols and try and get the global temperature down to 1.5. By that time, you've already got a lot of weakening of the AMOC. And what she found is there's no recovery at all. That's exactly what you're saying. It's a tipping point. You don't expect that it's an irreversible change. You don't expect there to be recovery. But mm. this, mo- this model is showing exactly that. So if we delay geoengineering too long, we can't prevent these tipping points because they'll already be happening. OK, let's get, dig into some of the challenges a bit more, because I do think we're sometimes guilty of sort of just airily saying, oh, we'll do geoengineering later on and sort this out. Um, but, you know, we're, we're nowhere, this is just one study. We're nowhere near ready for this yet. No. And I think the, there are lots of problems, but I think the biggest one is that in order to do this successfully, it, takes a, a, it will take very close international cooperation. In fact, there was a, another talk at a conference where uh, Steve Gardner from the University of Washington, Washington said, this is the greatest governance challenge that humanity has ever faced. <laughs> and, okay. and potentially uh, this would have to be global coordination for centuries because it's kind of long term, big projects. And it, it's kind of hard to have faith that everyone's going to muck along and, and do the same thing together. I guess one of the questions is um, this issue of termination shock. So, for example, we could start geoengineering um, and, and then stop when CO2 levels um, are still too high. And then we might see suddenly rapid warming on a scale where, you know, a more gradual change would have been easier to adapt to. Exactly. In fact, we may be going through a kind of mini termination shock at the moment. There are quite a lot of talks at the conference about the effect of all the sort of sulfate pollution that we've been pumping out for the past few decades, and now we're cleaning it up. Mm. And there's growing evidence that a lot of the rapid warming of the past decade, past two decades, is due to this cleaning up of the sulfate pollution. So it's been like a form of geoengineering that we're suddenly taking away, Mm. and now we're getting this very rapid warming in response. Of course, if we carried on pumping CO2 into the atmosphere and use geoengineering to compensate for that, we'll get an even bigger leap in warming in the future. And that's that's a big danger. This is why it's so important that we have political agreement uh, to make geoengineering work. We need to carry it on for a long, long time. And it also needs to be coordinated. So for instance, say one country decided to go it alone and you sort of just did geoengineering in the northern hemisphere, well then what you could do is shift the rain, the tropical rainfall zone could be shifted in one direction or another and that would obviously have huge consequences for agriculture. So there are these these big dangers. And in fact, we could even end up with climate wars. Imagine, for instance, that China decides to go it alone and it's sort of geoengineering to suit itself and the US decides a kind of geoengineering that China is doing is bad for it. So it starts geoengineering in a different way. And then you have these sort of conflicting things going on and, mm. and geoengineering actually being used as a weapon to yeah. sort, of, sort of fight a, a global battle. I mean, the, the CIA have said for years that they've identified climate as a, a huge factor in conflicts around the world. Um, but that's over things like water or, you know, food, uh, territory the traditional resources you need, but using geoengineering itself as a weapon in war, like, um, I mean, you you have to think that with the way things are, it's a real, it's a plausible scenario. Um, What if, let's just sort of be Mm. optimistic, (laughs) forcibly, brittily optimistic, (laughs) supposing we could get a a political agreement um, broadly, uh, when could we start doing this thing? Yeah, that unfortunately, that still doesn't solve the problem because there's we're just at such an early stage of researching this, uh, and there are some really serious dangers. So, for instance, uh, one of the talks at the conference was by someone called Jim Haywood, and he's been looking at something called marine cloud brightening. So, this is where you sort of release sulfates at sort of near sea level, and it makes the clouds whiter and they reflect more heat. Now, he did one experiment where he found that if you release these sulfates in certain parts of the world, it produces this mega La Nina effect that is so strong. Doesn't sound good. No, it's so strong. It actually changes the, pre- the air pressure over the Pacific Ocean so much that it raises sea level by more than global warming would up to that point. Wow, yeah. So, uh, so and, uh, he actually said... Um, this is inverse terraforming. This is making the Earth look like another planet. So uh, that is something 
we really don't want to be doing. And of course, the point of that research is to identify the dangers and make sure we don't ever do this. But we're just at such an early stage of doing this. So we, we can't yet sort of say, oh, we know enough to avoid this. Uh, to give another example, one of the things researchers are starting to do for climate sort of forecasts, they're starting to use these very high resolution models that we now use for weather, and they're starting to apply those to climate. And they're finding in some cases, these high resolution models are showing dangers that didn't show up in the lower resolution models. But no one's applied these to geoengineering yet, uh, Jim Hayward told me after the, one of the talks. Mm. So uh, we're not nearly at a point where we can say, this is what we should do and this is how we should do it and we could be confident that this is going to work and produce the desired effects. So we're in this really difficult situation then that if we're going to do it, we need to start doing it really soon to avoid these tipping points and and the sort of scary outcomes if things like the AMOC uh, collapse. Uh, But we can't actually start doing it soon because there's still so much that we don't know about it scientifically and the political sort of framework for doing it properly isn't there either. Absolutely. It's Catch-22. Yep, Mm. it's Catch-22. So I asked Claudia Wieners about this, um, the one, the the woman who gave, who presented that model, um, and she talked about walking the line over researching it and governing geoengineering. And here she is. The biggest issue is with SRM is maybe not so much physical side effects or imperfections, but the political risks that come with it, distraction from mitigation, and also just because SRM is relatively cheap, it could well be that one actor or small group of actors says we are going to do it, um, even if the rest of the world doesn't like it. Maybe this could lead to conflict, or even if it doesn't lead to conflict, it would still be unfair in the sense of not consulting everybody in a fair manner. What if someone makes a stupid kind of decision because maybe they don't care so much about really solving certain climate issues, but they just want the prestige of being seen as the powerful actor who is the guardian of the climate? So all these political problems you can't solve by climate modeling. But what is the solution to this? Because it's starting to feel like this could be the way we go, that um, a powerful actor will just take it upon themselves to to do something. I don't think there's anyone who really has a solution. I mean, of course, what you would want is that there's some kind of globally legitimized representative body that takes input from everyone, including poor countries and marginalized people within the countries taking their interests into account and then come up with a fair compromise of what to do. The question is how to make sure that happens. I still think that it's better to have discussion about SRM, including what it can do, but also very much what it cannot do and what are the dangers, rather to pushing it under the rug. Because suppose that the, this political bad scenario would happen that someone says, we're going to do it or we want to do it, then at least I hope that if that happens, we live in a world where we roughly know what can work and what can't. I think that the demon is out of the bottle. So SRM has already, it's not known by everyone on the street, but it's known by sufficiently many people that if something bad happens, let's say a huge heat wave in India, like in the Minister of the Future novel, people will come up saying, oh yeah, there's SRM. It, once we implement it, it works pretty quickly. So maybe we now the time has come to do it. And I'd rather than hope that enough people have information about what kind of implementations could be a decent idea and what are terribly horrible. So that at least you have good arguments if this actor will try to do it in the wrong way. But what I'm saying, like spreading the information, um, being open and transparent about it, sharing research, collaborating scientifically. All this is great, but all this is in no means a guarantee that this will be handled wise in a political way, especially seeing how the world is headed now. So SRM research is with the political situation now is getting more dangerous, but not SRM research, like not doing the research, also getting more dangerous because we are not going to the good direction with mitigation. So it's really a huge dilemma, this whole SAI thing. And even if it's yeah physically Maybe if you had an intelligent, benevolent, globally fair governance body to administer this, then probably using it from what we now know would be physically a good idea. But politically, in the real world, it's far more doubtful whether it's a good idea. Now, I mentioned that statement that world leaders put out. Um, from the Tipping Points Conference. Uh, And in that statement, they go on about how we need to trigger positive tipping points um, in economies, 
um, and societies. And what they want to do is basically generate self-propelling changes in technology and in behaviour to get us towards zero emissions. And there's two things to say about that. And the first is in the UK, we've got this independent committee called the Office for Budget Responsibility, the OBR. Uh, and yesterday or a couple of days ago, it produced a report finding that achieving net zero will be cheaper, much cheaper for the UK government than we previously thought. Mm. Um, and that the economic damages of climate change are, are far more severe mm. than the costs of, of net zero. It's the sort of thing we have been saying before, but this is yeah. from the OBR. And, and you know, with the, with the cost of solar especially um, coming down so fast, that's the sort of self-propelling positive tipping point changing technology mm. that they're talking about that we need. Yeah, and we're really seeing that at the moment. The cost of solar power is falling so fast, renewable energy in general, but especially it solar. It is absolutely stunning. So this is a great way of thinking about it, right? If you think of a coal-fired power station, its capacity is a gigawatt of power. Mm. Um, and that's that capacity of solar panels is now going up around the world every 15 every hours. Every 15 yeah. hours. Yeah, so the growth in renewable energy is unlike any the growth of any power source we've ever seen mm. before, including the Industrial Revolution. It's like we're at the start of the Industrial Revolution, except this time it's clean and this time it's bigger. And you mentioned positive tipping points earlier. Yeah, we, and we are actually working on a special podcast episode about positive tipping points, so uh, coming soon-ish.